Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Spring Church. We're so glad that you're here. Happy Fourth of July weekend to you. We're going to be celebrating our nation's independence, all that God's done in blessing our nation as we continue to seek his face. I'm going to invite you to remain seated for this first song as we start off with this great one. Stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky. On Independence Day, we're reminded of the profound value of our American rights and freedoms. But with each passing year, it becomes more difficult to fully embrace a spirit of celebration for our nation. While we have much to be grateful for, America continues to stray from the God who endowed us with our unalienable rights. And division, immorality, injustice, and violence grow more and more prevalent. 
This raises the question, is it worth pledging our allegiance to this broken nation? We believe so. There is still value to be found in the United States and its people. There is value in the enduring principles on which our nation was founded. As Christ followers, God has called us to serve the country we call home. America is a nation worth saving. Would you join us now as we honor our nation? Would you stand, remove your hat if you're wearing one, place your right hand over your heart as we do the Pledge of Allegiance followed by the National Anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous So gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still.
For nearly 250 years, the United States military has defended our freedom. At this time, we'd like to recognize the brave servicemen and women present with us today. Please stand during the anthem of your military branch. recognize the selfless members of the Coast Guard who guard our shores and respond to any call. Always ready. Coast Guardsmen, would you stand? We extend our deepest appreciation to the men and women of the Navy who navigate the vast seas and protect our shores. Sailors, would you stand? We express our gratitude to the brave members of the Air Force who soar through the skies to preserve our freedom. Airmen, would you stand? We honor the courageous men and women of the Army who embody dedication and sacrifice in their service to our nation. Soldiers, would you stand? We salute the pioneering members of the Space Force who exemplify vigilance, innovation, and perseverance in safeguarding our security. Guardians, would you stand? We pay tribute to the fearless Marines who embody honor, valor, and unwavering commitment. Marines, would you stand? Now, as a church, one more time, can we say thank you to all the brave men and women who have served and if there's anything worth a standing ovation, it's that. So go ahead and get up on your feet and let them know how thankful that you are for them. Wow. Wow. Woo! What I want to invite you to remain standing with us as we continue to sing together.
can almost hear the trumpet sound The Lord's return is near There are still so many people lost His message they must hear matter what we're going through in our joy and in our sorrow God is marching on and he cannot be defeated well let's continue standing and singing together we're gonna sing some songs right now about God's amazing grace and his faithfulness and his power
grace, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. This nation is worth saving, but what will save it? As we seek the solution, we must remember that it will not be found by looking from side to side, but rather upward. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. If America is to be healed, we must look to God. We desperately need His guidance. The healing of our nation happens one person at a time. It happens when God's people turn inward and humble themselves, accepting the cure only He can bring. On this Independence Day weekend in 2024, let us come together and lift our voices to the author of our freedom and the sustainer of our lives. God, forgive our sin, save our nation, heal our land.
is so great that he has many names. He reaches out to us with them to show us the many facets of his character. He's inviting us to get to know him. So come and meet God. Well, today at New Spring, we've celebrated America because we believe it's a nation worth saving. For one thing, there are 342 million people who are going to spend eternity somewhere. But beyond that, our nation was founded, no matter what the skeptics and the saccharine elitists would tell us, our nation was founded on Christian truth and principles. I don't know how many of you will recognize the name Earl Warren. Probably if you're not a baby boomer or older, you probably won't recognize that name. But Earl Warren was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And his Supreme Court was probably the most left-leaning of any Supreme Court in the history of the United States. So I just want to tell you before I give you this quote that Earl Warren was not a conservative. But he gave a talk that was picked up by Time Magazine before 600 leaders of the United States, including the President and the Vice President, Congressmen and Senators. And here's what Earl Warren said. I believe no one can read the history of our country without realizing that the good book and the spirit of the Savior have from the beginning been our guiding geniuses. Whether we look to the first charter of Virginia or the charter of New England, the charter of Massachusetts Bay, the same objective is present, a Christian land governed by Christian principles. I believe the entire Bill of Rights came into being because of the knowledge our forefathers had of the Bible and their belief in it. Freedom of belief, of expression, of assembly, of petition, the dignity of the individual, the sanctity of the home, equal justice under the law, and the reservation of powers to the people. I like to believe, Earl Warren said, that we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion. I like also to believe that as long as we do so, and listen to what he said, I like to believe as long as we do so, no great harm can come to our country. Earl Warren, Chief Justice, United States Supreme Court. Well, that's a while back, because since that time, America has given up on God. Today, 
Even if a minister were to say the words that Earl Warren said, he would be called an extremist, maybe even a Christian nationalist. But our nation has gone so far down the road to hell, I don't think we even realize how far down the road to hell we are. Because there was a time when left and right, I mean, as I said a few moments ago, Earl Warren was certainly no conservative. The most progressive, if you want to use that term, of the Supreme Courts were Earl Warren's court. And yet there was a time when Americans left and right recognized the founding of our nation was on Christian principles. And as he said, even the Bill of Rights was based on Christian principles. But that was a long time ago. And we live in a very different nation today. Our series is called Meet God. And last week, we began to look at the most frequently utilized name in Scripture for God. And that is the name Jehovah. Jehovah, we learned last week, means the self-existent one. None of us is self-existent. No one is self-existent. No, no human, no plant life, no animal life, nothing in our universe is self-existent. Only God. You see, we all depend on God for, for oxygen. We depend on God for our well-being. You know, someone will say, well, I, I, I work for everything I get. I understand what's behind that statement, but at the end of the day, it is God that gives us the ability to think, to work, to move, and to be successful. And yet God does not depend on anyone. God is self-existent. He does not ask anyone's advice. He does not depend on anyone's uh, enabling. God is God. He is the self-existent one. And we saw that last week, the first time in the Bible the name Jehovah is given is when Moses was saying to God, I got to go back and tell the people that you sent me, but nobody knows your name. And that is when God said, I am Yahweh. I am the self-existent one. I am who I am, or as we saw last week, Hebrew scholars say it's a little more pregnant with meaning than that. Hebrew scholars say it means I will be who I will be. Maybe that's what we need to think about as we go into this topic today, because I want to tell you ahead of time, today's talk is a solemn talk. It is a talk that's going to call to us as Christ followers to make a serious decision about who we are and what we're about. It's perfect timing. Our theme for today's service is a nation worth saving. The reason why it's fitting is because there was another nation in the Bible that also, like America, gave up on Jehovah. They shouldn't have, because just like America, God had been very good to them. And maybe it's time for us today, as Americans, those of us who are Americans, to recognize that our God has been very good to us here in America. And we can't even begin to talk about how good he's been. I was working on this message with Steve and Paul on Wednesday, and Stephen is a much better student of history than I am. But Stephen said something that grabbed my attention. He said, Dad, the only reason why America even exists today is the miracle hand of Almighty God. And he began to go over in history for me four eras of time in which if God's miracle hand had not been on us, we would not have survived. He talked about the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the World War II, and the Cold War. And after illustration after illustration and point after point, Stephen said, if God had not looked out for us in that time, he even talked about in the Revolutionary War early on when George Washington and the Revolutionary Army was about to be defeated, but God sent a very strange fog that allowed Washington and his army to retreat. Over and over and over, you can see God's miracle hand. And I agree with Stephen that in those four moments, the Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War II, and Cold War, if God had not been with us, you would not be here today. You would not be sitting here free in this, in this land. And this is just personal, but I get a little sick at my stomach at a lot of people that want to throw America in the trash heap. We have our problems, but at the same time, God has been very good to us, and no one who has any scintilla of gratitude would forget about those things that God has done for us. I have long loved a quote that Benjamin Franklin gave at the first Constitutional Convention. He said, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And I love this part. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it prob probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the secret writings that, quote, except the Lord build, they labor in vain and build it. I firmly believe, Franklin said, without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building, speaking of the United States, no better than the builders of Babel. Benjamin Franklin, First Constitutional Convention. 
Well, like America, this other nation gave up on God after God had done miracle after miracle for them. It was the fledgling nation of Israel when God was leading them through the wilderness into the promised land. And God had been good to them. When Moses went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said what Moses thought he would say. Who is your God that I should let Israel go? And God gave him 10 business cards, which is where I got the idea for the graphic for this series. 10 plagues. They came to the Red Sea at flood stage and God opened it up. They got water from a rock. They got manna in the wilderness. The Bible says that people ate angels' food. So God took food off the table of the angels and gave it down to the Israelites. He gave them a pillar of cloud to keep them cool in the desert daytimes and a pillar of fire to keep them warm on desert nights. And yet they gave up on God. And all it took for them to give up on God was having to wait for a few weeks. I don't have time to tell the story at length, but you can read about it in the book of Exodus, if you will. We're headed for Exodus 32. Moses had been called up on Mount Sinai by God, and God was going to give him the Ten Commandments, but not only the Ten Commandments, but he was going to give them the plan for the nation. He was going to give them the plan for the tabernacle. He was going to show them their destiny and their future. And it kept Moses up on the mountain for 40 days. While he was up on the mountain in those 40 days, the people got tired of waiting and things collapsed back in this fledgling nation on the ground. Let's read Exodus 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother they left in charge. They gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt. By the way, it wasn't Moses that brought him out. It was God. We don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered, I think he's thinking, you know what, if I tell them this is going to cost money, then they'll give up on the plan. (laughs) Aaron said, take off the gold earrings that your wives and sons and daughters are wearing and bring them to me. I think he thought they wouldn't do it, but they did. All the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He made an idol cast in the shape of a calf. That's what they worship back in Egypt. Then they said, Aaron didn't say this, but the people said this, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Wow. Well, Aaron, just reading between the lines here, Aaron's going to try to find a way to have middle ground. See, that's where most American Christians are today. We want some way to have middle ground. Uh, We're going to figure out how to have the golden calf, but we're going to say that this calf is about worshiping Jehovah. Well, That's how it started out. Verse 5, Aaron built an altar in front of the calf and announced tomorrow there will be a festival to Jehovah. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. They went to church. They sang. They had the service. But then it says afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reveille. That is your translation being a little bit euphemistic. What they did was they started an orgy. Now think about that. They figured out a way that somehow they could worship Jehovah and have an orgy at the same time. Well, it didn't take God by surprise. And beyond that, it didn't throw God off because in verse seven of this chapter, the Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Isn't that America today? I believe America is a nation worth saving. But we have sins that we need to repent of in America. And most of all, we need to call them sins because they are sins. They're not culture. They're wickedness. Our nation has devalued the lives of children and aborted millions of them in the name of convenience. Our nation has allowed entertainment to become an idol even more than the golden calf. And instead of asking God for his advice how to live, Americans have waded through the sewer of pop culture to find it. Americans get angry at each other over things that don't matter and throw curses at each other when we should be blessing one another. We've thrown away God's model for what healthy sex was designed to be like. God put one man and one woman in the Garden of Eden, not one man and a lot of women or one woman and a lot of men or two men or two women. He designed sex to be between a man and a woman in a covenant relationship, but America has forgotten that now and thrown it into the trash heap. We have a ridiculous culture teaching kids they can change their gender so young boys and girls are getting irreversible surgery and later on when many regret it, they're told they can't take it back. 
Porn is destroying marriages inside and outside the church. America claims to be tolerant. We're the most unforgiving people in the history of the world. Our culture promotes terrible behavior, then cancels people for behaving the way the culture taught them to behave. And that's just the rank and file. Our leaders, thank God, not all, but in many cases, our leaders are the very champions of this wickedness, just like we read about in the Bible. And worst of all, worst of all, many ministry leaders who stand in places like I'm standing today, those we should be able to trust the most have engaged in terrible sin. Listen, New Spring, we don't have to try very hard to make the connection between the orgy at the Golden Calf in America in 2024. So what does God have to say about that? Is God wringing his hands in the heavens saying, oh my goodness, this nation is out of control. I guess somehow I'm going to have to adjust my plan to somehow dumb it down or grade on the curve for America. The Bible says that when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, he stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on Jehovah's side? Who is on Jehovah's side? Who is on Jehovah's side? Come and stand with me. And I have to tell you that this was one of the very first messages that God gave me long ago when this series began. It is not a message that I, I, I've delivered it several times this weekend. It is not a message I deliver with relish. I am not a confrontational person. I am a person who always likes to affirm. I'm, that's just my very nature. But you understand, I do not write the messages. I am just the postman delivering the mail. The messages come from a much higher source. And that is God's question to America today. Who is on Jehovah's side? Well, that's where I'm going to have to stop the message, but I'll point out three things that happen here in our text. There's no doubt, no doubt about it. There were some who were on the devil's side. There were 3,000 people in this story that God brought down judgment on. And then there were some who responded to Moses, some of the Levites. But it's kind of disappointing because there were somewhere between two and two and a half, maybe three million people there. And it just seems like when Moses said, who is on Jehovah's side, a relatively small group of people stood up and said, we are. I put two and two together and I draw that there were a lot of bystanders that day. When Moses came down from the mountain, there were a lot of people that were in the soft, gooey middle, or at least that's where they were trying to stand. I sort of hear what they had to say. They would have said something to the effect that, well, I don't want to judge. Listen to me, New Springers. If you say, I don't want to judge when God has already judged, you just are basically saying, I don't stand with Jehovah. Now, you can say that all day long. You, and, and, and here's the thing, we don't need to judge. When God is judged, that's the judgment. And that's the judgment for me. It's the judgment for anybody else. But if I say I don't want to judge and I claim to follow Jehovah and I will not articulate what Jehovah said in his judgment, then I'm a fraud. Now, if, if I issue a judgment and I give my opinion about something or someone, then, then that would be judgment. But it's as it is today. There are those, what happened here in our text, there are those who are on Satan's side. They are the promulgators. They are the ones who promote the wickedness that are in, that's going on in America today. And they're clearly on Satan's side. I know it's popular. I know that the things that they articulate, those are things that are well accepted today. But at the end of the day, the Bible's very clear where God is. The Bible's clear where Jehovah is. The Bible is clear where Satan is. And nothing has changed on that just because it's 2024. But the thing that does give me peace here, at least a little bit of comfort, is it appears that on this day there were relatively few, as I said, there were probably somewhere between two and a half million people, maybe three million people, but there were only 3,000 people that were judged that day. You know, I think there are fewer people today that are behind all the wickedness in America than we think there are. It's just that their voice and their influence is so outsized. Most Americans, I think today, are pretty much where the people of Israel were, in the middle. 
In their minds, they were not on Satan's side, but they weren't, they weren't willing to step up and say, I stand with Jehovah. They were in that soft, gooey middle. But I want you to understand something. And again, this isn't Mark. I preach this message with fear and trembling. This is not a message I want to preach. I'd like to preach something a lot more affirming today, but I stand between heaven and hell to give you the word of God today. I, I love you enough to tell you that the idea of the middle is a mythical idea. There is no middle ground. You say, Mark, where do you come up with that? I didn't come up with that. Jesus came up with that. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and his gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and comparably few find it. I mean, how many roads did you count? I counted two. There's a highway to hell that's broad. And there's a narrow way where comparably few travel that road. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. The loving Jesus said that. But then there are those that when the call goes out, who is on Jehovah's side? They answer back, I am on Jehovah's side. I am. And you hear the voice of Jehovah in 2024, just as it was in Exodus 32, where the voice of Jehovah calls out and says, if you are on my side, then come and stand with me. Don't stay in the soft, gooey middle that doesn't even exist in the first place. Come and stand with me. And I know there are those so many in the soft, gooey middle that say, Mark, I just, I have to be accepted. I have to be accepted by the culture. I can't have anyone tell me that I am not a good person because I don't drink. Listen to me, please. Let me tell you, there, there is no benefit in standing in that soft, gooey middle. The world will give you a cookie and some Kool-Aid, tell you to put your head on your desk and wait till eternity. But that is a very bad plan. It's a cosmically catastrophic plan because you do understand that the day is coming when we're all gonna stand before God and give an account. And that judgment is not gonna take place on TikTok. It's not gonna take, take place on Facebook. It's not going to take place in Washington, D.C. or Topeka. It is gonna take place in the courtroom of heaven. I wanna make sure I'm on the right side that day. Well, I know I'm talking to a lot of people here today that would say, Mark, I am on Jehovah's side. I have some good news for you, and I want to give it to you, and then I'll, we'll, we'll end this service. Jehovah has always noticed when people stand for him. I want to give you two scriptures. I could give you a whole lot, but I want to give you two. The first is from the book of Ezekiel, and this is when Judah is about to undergo judgment. And God is talking to an angel, and God basically is about to TCOB. He's about to take care of business. So I want to read verse 3 of Ezekiel chapter 9. Then the glory of the God of Israel rose up from between the cherubim where it had rested and moved to the entrance of the temple. And Jehovah called to the man dressed in linen who was carrying the rider's case. That's the angel. And he said to him, walk through the streets of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of all who weep and sigh because of the detestable sins being committed in the city. Is that you? There are three groups of people here. There are three groups of people watching. There are people who cheer for the wickedness in the city. You are for it. And then there are those who, they're not good with it, but they're afraid to say anything about it. Now you saw what I saw. God said, put a mark on those who weep and sigh because of the wickedness going on. And then God would say to the angel, make sure nothing happens to those people. Malachi 3, next to the last chapter of the Old Testament. Same situation. But in these days, there were a lot of people, and this book is really written to believers, so-called, who are in that soft, gooey middle. Because what happened in Malachi's day, there were a lot of people that said, it doesn't pay to serve God. 
It, it doesn't pay to take a stand for God. People call you names. And people, you, know, you, you wind up outcasts. And so. They were saying it doesn't, pay any, it doesn't pay to serve God. It looks like the people that hate God, they're the ones that are, that are doing fine. And, and that's what was going on. You can read the book of Malachi and you'll see that. But there were people who stood for Jehovah. In the minority, of course. But I want you to read, see what I see. Then those who feared Jehovah spoke with each other, and Jehovah listened to what they said. You see, there were people in these days of wickedness that loved God, believed God, knew that what was going on was wrong. And they didn't have a microphone, and they couldn't speak to the culture, but you know what they did? They found other people who believed the same thing, and the Bible says that they encouraged each other by talking to each other about what God was doing. Now, I love that, but what I love more than that is the Bible says Jehovah eavesdropped and listened to them. But that's not all. Jehovah listened to what they said in his presence. That's up in heaven. A scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought, here's our series, about the honor of his, what, New Spring? His name, Jehovah, the self-existent one. They're like, oh, well, look, you know what? We're not going to drink the Kool-Aid of pop culture. We're not going to be like bobblehead dolls that when somebody thunks us on the head and tells us to believe something, that we just go ahead and believe it. They, they, they believed in Jehovah God. They knew he was self-existent. They knew he was going to win. They knew that he was not going to fail. They were in the minority, but hey, the minority plus God is the majority. And they weren't gutless. They weren't soft, doughy, gooey, middle people. These were people that believed in Jehovah and they talked to each other and Jehovah listened to them. And Jehovah said, wait a minute, get, get, get a pad, write down these names. On the day when I act in judgment, Jehovah said, they will be my own special treasure. Then you will see again the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. I ask you on this Independence Day weekend in 2024, who is on Jehovah's side? If you are on his side, then stand with him and say, I am on Jehovah's side and I will not sit on the sideline and I will not be quiet. I may fail. I may take two steps forward and one step back. I, I may not always look like a Christian, but I am on Jehovah's side and I am not ashamed to stand with him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for how you have met with us today. Jehovah, we are on your side. Not because we will not fail, but because you will not fail. And we love you. Please write our names in your book of remembrance. We are not afraid to be in the minority. We are just afraid to be on the other side. And now with just a few seconds left, somebody could say here, Mark, how do I, how do I know for sure that I'm on Jehovah's side? Because some days I, I really wonder about where I am with God. You don't have to do that. Because getting on God's side is free. The Bible tells us that God loves you, and even though your sin and my sin separates us from God, that Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sin so that we could be forgiven of everything we ever have done or will do wrong. And three days later, Jesus came out of the grave, and he says, whoever believes on him, whoever will trust Jesus as Lord and Savior will be forgiven. And if that's where you are today, whether you're here in South Auditorium, North Auditorium, watching online, watching on television, you can pray and have that peace of mind. Pray with me. You don't have to pray out loud, but just pray in your heart if you want to pray. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you love me. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he arose from the grave. And because Jesus is alive, 
I want him to be my savior and my king. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed with me, I have a gift I want to give you. It's a box that's got a New Spring Bible, a book I wrote called My New Walk with God. If you're watching online or television, all you have to do is text the word PRAY, P-R-A-Y-E-D, to 97,000. Follow the steps. We'll mail this to you. If you're here in the house, in any of our auditoriums, and you just pray with me, go back to any info center and say, I prayed with Mark. You can take it home. God bless. Have a happy and safe 4th of July.